AI Read to Me presents The Chimes by Charles Dickens. Now close your eyes and relax. First Quarter There are not many people, and as it is desirable that a storyteller and a story reader should establish a mutual understanding as soon as possible, I beg it to be noticed that I confine this observation neither to young people nor to little people, but extend it to all conditions of people, little and big, young and old, yet growing up or already growing down again. There are not, I say, many people who would care to sleep in a church. I don't mean at sermon time in warm weather, when the thing has actually been done once or twice, but in the night and alone. A great multitude of persons will be violently astonished, I know, by this position in the broad, bold day. But it applies to night. It must be argued by night. And I will undertake to maintain it successfully on any gusty winter's night appointed for the purpose, with any one opponent chosen from the rest, who will meet me singly in an old churchyard, before an old church door, and will previously empower me to lock him in, if needful to his satisfaction, until morning. For the night wind has a dismal trick of wandering round and round a building of that sort, and moaning as it goes, and of trying with its unseen hand, the windows and the doors, and seeking out some crevices by which to enter. And when it has got in as one, not finding what it seeks, whatever that may be, it wails and howls to issue forth again, and not content with stalking through the aisles, and gliding round and round the pillars, and tempting the deep organ, soars up to the roof, and strives to rend the rafters, then flings itself despairingly upon the stones below, and passes, muttering, into the vaults. Ugh! Heaven preserve us, sitting snugly round the fire, it has an awful voice, that wind at midnight, singing in a church. But, high up in the steeple, there the foul blast roars and whistles. High up in the steeple, where it is free to come and go through many an airy arch and loophole, and to twist and twine itself about the giddy stair, and twirl the groaning weathercock, and make the very tower shake and shiver. High up in the steeple of an old church, far above the light and murmur of the town, and far below the flying clouds that shadow it, is the wild and dreary place at night, and high up in the steeple of an old church dwelt the chimes I tell of. They were old chimes, trust me. Centuries ago, these bells had been baptized by bishops, so many centuries ago that the register of their baptism was lost long, long before the memory of man, and no one knew their names. They had had their godfathers and godmothers. These bells, for my part, by the way, I would rather incur the responsibility of being godfather to a bell than a boy, and had had their silver mugs, no doubt, besides. But time had mowed down their sponsors, and Henry the Eighth had melted down their mugs, and they now hung, nameless and mugless, in the church tower. Not speechless, though. 
far from it. They had clear, loud, lusty, sounding voices. At these bells, and far and wide, they might be heard upon the wind. Much too sturdy chimes were they, to be dependent on the pleasure of the wind, moreover for fighting gallantly against it when it took an adverse whim. They would pour their cheerful notes into a listening ear right royally and bent on being heard on stormy nights by some poor mother watching a sick child or some lone wife whose husband was at sea. They had been sometimes known to beat a blustering nor'wester eye, all to fits, as Toby Vec said. For though they chose to call him Trotty Vec, his name was Toby, and nobody could make it anything else either, except Tobias. He having been as lawfully christened in his day as the bells had been in theirs, though with not quite so much of solemnity or public rejoicing. For my part, I confess myself of Toby Veck's belief, for I am sure he had opportunities enough of forming a correct one. And whatever Toby Veck said, I say, and I take my stand by Toby Veck, although he did stand all day long and weary work it was, just outside the church door. In fact, he was a ticket porter, Toby Veck, and waited there for jobs. And a breezy, goose-skinned, blue-nosed, red-eyed, stony-toed, tooth-chattering place it was to wait in, in the winter time, as Toby Veck well knew. The wind came tearing round the corner, especially the east wind, as if it had sallied forth, express, from the confines of the earth, to have a blow at Toby. And oftentimes, it seemed to come upon him sooner than it had expected, for bouncing round the corner and passing Toby, it would suddenly wheel round again as if it cried, why, here he is. Toby was curious about the bells, because there were points of resemblance between them and him. They hung there in all weathers, with the wind and rain driving in upon them, facing only the outsides of all the houses, never getting any nearer to the blazing fires that gleamed and shone upon the windows, or came puffing out of the chimney tops, and incapable of participating in any of the good things that were constantly being handed through the street doors and iron railings to prodigious cooks. Being but a simple man, he invested the bells with a strange and solemn character. They were so mysterious, often heard, and never seen so high up, so far off, so full of such a deep, strong melody, that he regarded them with a species of awe. And sometimes, when he looked up at the dark, arched windows in the tower, he half expected to be beckoned to by something which was not a bell, and yet was what he heard so often sounding in the chimes. For all this, Toby scouted with indignation a certain flying rumor that the chimes were haunted, as implying the possibility of their being connected with any evil thing. In short, they were very often in his ears and very often in his thoughts, but always in his good opinion. And he very often got such a crick in his neck by staring with his mouth wide open at the steeple where they hung, that he was fain to take an extra trot or two afterward to cure.
cure it. The very thing he was in the act of doing one cold day, when the last drowsy sound of twelve o'clock just struck, was humming like a melodious monster of a bee, and not by any means a busy bee, all through the steeple. Dinner time, eh? said Toby, trotting up and down before the church. Ah, Toby's nose was very red, and his eyelids were very red, and he winked very much, and his shoulders were very near his ears, and his legs were very stiff, and altogether he was evidently a long way upon the frosty side of cool. Dinner time, eh? repeated Toby, using his right hand muffler like an infantine boxing glove and punishing his chest for being cold. Ah, he took a silent trot after that for a minute or two. There's nothing, said Toby, more regular in its coming round than dinner time and nothing less regular in its coming round than dinner. That's the great difference between them. It's took me a long time to find it out. I wonder whether it would be worth any gentleman's while now to buy that observation for the papers or the parliament. Tony was only joking, for he gravely shook his head in self-depreciation why? Lord, said Toby, the papers is full of observations as it is, and so's the Parliament. Here's last week's paper, now taking a very dirty one from his pocket, and holding it from him at arm's length full of observations. Full of observations. I like to know the news as well as any man, said Toby, slowly folding it a little smaller and putting it in his pocket again. But it almost goes against the grain with me to read a paper now. It frightens me almost. I don't know what we poor people are coming to. Lord send we may be coming to something better in the new year nigh upon us. Why, father, father, said a pleasant voice, hard by. But Toby, not hearing it, continued to trot backward and forward, musing as he went, and talking to himself. It seems as if we can't go right, or do right, or be righted, said Toby. I hadn't much schooling myself when I was young and I can't make out whether we have any business on the face of the earth or not. Sometimes I think we must have, a little, and sometimes I think we must be intruding. I get so puzzled sometimes that I'm not even able to make up my mind whether there is any good at all in us or whether we are born bad. We seem to do dreadful things. We seem to give a deal of trouble. We are always being complained of and guarded against. One way or another, we fill the papers. Talk of a new year, said Toby mournfully. I can bear up as well as another man at most times better than a good many, for I am as strong as a lion and all men ant. But supposing it should really be that we have no right to a new year, supposing we really are intruding. Why, father, father, said the pleasant voice again. Toby heard it this time, started stopped, and shortening his sight, which had been directed a long way off as seeking for enlightenment in the very heart of the approaching year, found himself face to face with his own child and looking close into her eyes. 
bright eyes they were. Eyes that would bear a world of looking in before their depth was fathomed. Dark eyes that reflected back the eyes which searched them not flashingly or at the owner's will, but with a clear, calm, honest, patient radiance, claiming kindred with that light which heaven called into being. Eyes that were beautiful and true and beaming with hope. With hope so young and fresh, with hope so buoyant, vigorous and bright, despite the twenty years of work and poverty on which they had looked, that they became a voice to Trotty Vec and said, I think we have some business here, a little. Trotty kissed the lips belonging to the eyes and squeezed the blooming face between his hands. Why, pet, said Trotty, what's to do? I didn't expect you today, Meg. Neither did I expect to come, father, cried the girl, nodding her head and smiling as she spoke. But here I am, and not alone, not alone. Why you don't mean to say, observed Trotty, looking curiously at a covered basket which she carried in her hand, that you smell it, father dear, said Meg, only smell it. Trotty was going to lift up the cover at once, in a great hurry, when she gaily interposed her hand. No, 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 said Meg, with the glee of a child. Lengthen it out a little. Let me just lift up the corner, just the little tiny corner, you know, said Meg, suiting the action to the word with the utmost gentleness and speaking very softly, as if she were afraid of being overheard by something inside the basket there. Now, what's that? Toby took the shortest possible sniff at the edge of the basket and cried out in a rapture, Why, it's hot. It is burning hot, cried Meg. Ha, 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 it's scalding hot. Ha, 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 roared Toby with a sort of kick. It's scalding hot. But what is it, father? said Meg. Come, you haven't guessed what it is. And you must guess what it is. I can't think of taking it out till you guess what it is. Don't be in such a hurry. Wait a minute. A little bit more of the cover. Now guess. Meg was in a perfect fright lest he should guess right too soon shrinking away as she held the basket toward him, curling up her pretty shoulders, stopping her ear with her hand, as if, by so doing, she could keep the right word out of Toby's lips and laughing softly the whole time. Meanwhile, Toby, putting a hand on each knee, bent down his nose to the basket and took a long inspiration at the lid, the grin upon his withered face expanded in the process, as if he were inhaling laughing gas. Ah, it's very nice, said Toby. It ain't, I suppose it ain't Polonies. No, 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 cried Meg, delighted. Nothing like Polonies. No, said Toby after another sniff. It's, it's mellower than Polonies. It's very nice. It improves every moment. It's too decided for trotters. Ain't it? Meg was in ecstasy. He could not have gone wider of the mark than trotters, except Polonies. Liver, said Toby, communing with himself. No, there's a mildness about it that don't answer to liver. Petitos, no, 
It ain't faint enough for petitos. It wants the stringiness of cock's heads, and I know it ain't sausages. I'll tell you what it is. It's chitterlings. No, it ain't, cried Meg in a burst of delight. No, it ain't. Why, what am I a-thinking of, said Toby, suddenly recovering a position as near the perpendicular as it was possible for him to assume. I shall forget my own name next. It's tripe. Tripe it was, and Meg, in high joy, protested he should say, in half a minute more, it was the best tripe ever stewed. And so, said Meg, busying herself exultingly with her basket, I'll lay the cloth at once, father, for I have brought the tripe in a basin, and tied the basin up in a pocket handkerchief, and if I like to be proud for once, and spread that for a cloth, and call it a cloth, there's no law to prevent me, is there, father? Not that I know of, my dear, said Toby, but they're always a bringing up some new law or other. And according to what I was reading you in the paper the other day, Father, what the judge said, you know, we poor people are supposed to know them all. Ha <laughs> ha. What a mistake. My goodness me, how clever they think us. Yes, my dear, cried Trotty and they'd be very fond of any one of us that did know em all. He'd grow fat upon the work he'd get, that man, and be popular with the gentlefolks in his neighborhood. Very much so. He'd eat his dinner with an appetite, whoever he was. If it smelt like this, said Meg cheerfully, make haste, for there's a potato besides. Where will you dine, father? On the post or on the steps? Dear, dear, how grand we are. Two places to choose from. The steps today, my pet, said Trotty. Steps in dry weather. Post in wet. There's a great conveniency in the steps at all times. Because of the sitting down, but they're rheumatic in the damp. Then here, said Meg, clapping her hands. After a moment's bustle, here it is, all ready, and beautiful, it looks. Come, father, eat it while it's hot. Come. Since his discovery of the contents of the basket, Trotty had been standing looking at her and had been speaking too, in an abstracted manner, which showed that though she was the object of his thoughts and eyes, to the exclusion even of tripe, he neither saw nor thought about her as she was at that moment, but had before him some imaginary rough sketch or drama of her future life. Roused now, by her cheerful summons, he shook off a melancholy shake of the head, which was just coming upon him, and trotted to her side. As he was stooping to sit down, the chimes rang. Amen, said Trotty, pulling off his hat and looking up toward them. Amen to the bells, father, cried Meg. They broke in like a grace, my dear, said Trotty, taking his seat. They'd say a good one, I am sure, if they could. Many's the kind thing they say to me. The bells do, father, laughed Meg, as she set the basin, and a knife and fork before him. Well. Seem to, my pet, said Trotty falling to with great vigor. And where's the difference? If I hear em, what does it matter whether they speak it or not? Why bless you, my dear, said Toby, pointing at the tower with his fork. 
and becoming more animated under the influence of dinner. How often have I heard them bells say, Toby Veck, Toby Veck, keep a good heart, Toby. Toby Veck, Toby Veck, keep a good heart, Toby. A million times? More? Well, I never, cried Meg. She had, though, over and over again, for it was Toby's constant topic. When things is very bad, said Trotty, very bad indeed. I mean, almost at the worst, then, it's Toby Veck, Toby Veck, job coming soon, Toby. Toby Veck, Toby Veck, job coming soon, Toby. That way. And it comes, at last, father, said Meg, with a touch of sadness in her pleasant voice. Always, answered the unconscious Toby, never fails. While this discourse was holding, Trotty made no pause in his attack upon the savory meat before him, but cut and ate and cut and drank and cut and chewed and dodged about from tripe to hot potato and from hot potato back again to tripe with an unctuous and unflagging relish. But happening now to look all round the street, in case anybody should be beckoning from any door or window for a porter, his eyes, in coming back again, encountered Meg, sitting opposite to him, with her arms folded, and only busy in watching his progress with a smile of happiness. Why, Lord, forgive me, said Trotty, dropping his knife and fork. My love, Meg, why didn't you tell me what a beast I was? Father? Sitting here, said Trotty, in penitent explanation, cramming and stuffing and gorging myself and you before me there never so much as breaking your precious fast, nor wanting to, when. But I have broken it, father, interposed his daughter, laughing, all to bits. I have had my dinner. Nonsense, said Trotty. Two dinners in one day. It ain't possible. You might as well tell me that two New Year's days will come together, or that I have had a gold head all my life and never changed it. I have had my dinner, father, for all that, said Meg, coming nearer to him. And if you'll go on with yours, I'll tell you how and where and how your dinner came to be brought, and something else besides. Toby still appeared incredulous, but she looked into his face with her clear eyes, and laying her hand upon his shoulder, motioned him to go on while the meat was hot. So Trotty took up his knife and fork again and went to work, but much more slowly than before, and shaking his head as if he were not at all pleased with himself. I had my dinner, father, said Meg, after a little hesitation, with, with Richard. His dinner time was early, and as he brought his dinner with him when he came to see me, we, we had it together, father. Trotty said, oh, because she waited, and Richard says, father, Meg resumed then stopped. What does Richard say, Meg? asked Toby. Richard says, Father, another stoppage. Richard's a long time saying it, said Toby. He says then, Father, Meg continued, lifting up her eyes at last, and speaking in a tremble. But quite plainly, another year is nearly gone. And where is the use of waiting on from year to year when it is so unlikely we shall ever be better off 
than we are now. He says we are poor now, Father, and we shall be poor then. But we are young now, and years will make us old before we know it. He says that if we wait, people in our condition, until we see our way quite clearly, the way will be a narrow one indeed, the common way, the grave, Father. A bolder man than Trotty Veck must needs have drawn upon his boldness largely to deny it. Trotty held his peace. And how hard, Father, to grow old and die and think we might have cheered and helped each other. How hard in all our lives to love each other and to grieve apart, to see each other working, changing, growing old and gray. Even if I got the better of it and forgot him, which I never could. Oh, Father dear, how hard to have a heart so full as mine is now, and live to have it slowly drained out every drop without the recollection of one happy moment of a woman's life, to stay behind and comfort me and make me better. Trotty sat quite still. Meg dried her eyes and said more gaily, that is to say, with here a laugh and there a sob, and here a laugh and sob together. So Richard says, Father, as his work was yesterday, made certain for some time to come, and as I love him and have loved him fully three years, ah, uh, longer than that if he knew it, Will I marry him on New Year's Day, the best and happiest day, he says, in the whole year, and one that is almost sure to bring good fortune with it. It's a short notice, Father, isn't it? But I haven't my fortune to be settled, or my wedding dresses to be made. Like the great ladies, Father, have I? And he said so much and said it in his way so strong and earnest, and all the time so kind and gentle, that I said I'd come and talk to you, Father. And as they paid the money for that work of mine this morning, unexpectedly, I am sure, and as you have fared very poorly for a whole week, and as I couldn't help wishing there should be something to make this day a sort of holiday to you, as well as a dear and happy day to me, Father. I made a little treat and brought it to surprise you. And see how he leaves it cooling on the step, said another voice. It was the voice of the same Richard, who had come upon them unobserved, and stood before the father and daughter, looking down upon them, with a face as glowing as the iron on which his stout sledgehammer daily rung. A handsome, well-made, powerful youngster, he was with eyes that sparkled like the red-hot droppings from a furnace fire, black hair that curled about his swarthy temples rarely, and a smile, a smile that bore out Meg's eulogium on his style of conversation. See how he leaves it cooling on the step, said Richard. Meg don't know what he likes. Not she. Trotty, all action and enthusiasm, immediately reached up his hand to Richard and was going to address him in a great hurry when the house door opened without any warning and a footman very nearly put his foot in the tripe. Out of the vase here, will you? You must always go and be a settin' on our steps, must you? You can't go and give a turn to none of the neighbors, never, can't you? Will you clear the road, or won't you? 
strictly speaking, the last question was irrelevant, as they had already done it. What's the matter? What's the matter? said the gentleman, for whom the door was opened coming out of the house at that kind of light, heavy pace. That peculiar compromise between a walk and jog trot, with which a gentleman upon the smooth downhill of life, wearing creaking boots, a watch chain, and clean linen, may come out of his house, not only without any abatement of his dignity, but with an expression of having important and wealthy engagements elsewhere. What's the matter? What's the matter? You're always a being begged and prayed upon your bended knees. You are, said the footman, with great emphasis to Trotty Vec, to let our doorsteps be. Why don't you let them be? Can't you let them be? There. That'll do, that'll do, said the gentleman. Hello there, porter. Beckoning with his head to Trotty Vec, come here. What's that, your dinner? Yes, sir, said Trotty, leaving it behind him in a corner. Don't leave it there, exclaimed the gentleman. Bring it here, bring it here. So, this is your dinner, is it? Yes, sir, repeated Trotty, looking with a fixed eye and a watery mouth at the piece of tripe he had reserved for a last delicious titbit, which the gentleman was now turning over and over on the end of a fork. Two other gentlemen had come out with him. One was a low-spirited gentleman of middle age, of a meager habit, and a disconsolate face who kept his hands continually in the pockets of his scanty pepper-and-salt trousers, very large and dog's-eared from that custom, and was not particularly well-brushed or washed. The other, a full-sized, sleek, well-conditioned gentleman, in a blue coat, with bright buttons and a white cravat. This gentleman had a very red face, as if an undue proportion of the blood in his body were squeezed up into his head, which perhaps accounted for his having also the appearance of being rather cold about the heart. He who had Toby's meat upon the fork called to the first one by the name of Filer, and they both drew near together. Mr. Filer, being exceedingly short-sighted, was obliged to go so close to the remnant of Toby's dinner before he could make out what it was that Toby's heart leaped up into his mouth. But Mr. Filer didn't eat it. This is a description of animal food, Alderman, said Filer, making little punches in it with a pencil case commonly known to the laboring population of this country by the name of tripe. The alderman laughed and winked, for he was a merry fellow. Alderman cute. Oh, and a sly fellow too. A knowing fellow. Up to everything. Not to be imposed upon. Deep in the people's hearts. He knew them. Cute did. I believe you. But who eats tripe? said Mr. Filer, looking round. Tripe is without an exception the least economical and the most wasteful article of consumption that the markets of this country can by possibility produce. The loss upon a pound of tripe has been found to be, in the boiling, seven-eighths of a fifth more than the loss upon a pound of any other animal substance, whatever. Tripe is more expensive, properly understood, than the hothouse pineapple. Taking into account 
the number of animals slaughtered yearly within the bills of mortality alone, and forming a low estimate of the quantity of tripe which the carcasses of these animals, reasonably well butchered, would yield. I find that the waste on that amount of tripe, if boiled, would victual a garrison of five hundred men for five months of thirty-one days each, and a February over. The waste, the waste. Trotty stood aghast, and his legs shook under him. He seemed to have starved a garrison of five hundred men with his own hand. Who eats tripe? said Mr. Filer warmly. Who eats tripe? Trotty made a miserable bow. You do, do you? said Mr. Filer. Then I'll tell you something. You snatch your tripe, my friend, out of the mouths of widows and orphans. I hope not, sir, said Trotty faintly. I'd sooner die of want. Divide the amount of tripe before mentioned, Alderman, said Mr. Filer, by the estimated number of existing widows and orphans, and the result will be one pennyweight of tripe to each. Not a grain is left for that man. Consequently, he's a robber. Trotty was so shocked that it gave him no concern to see the alderman finish the tripe himself. It was a relief to get rid of it, anyhow. And what do you say? asked the alderman, jocosely, of the red-faced gentleman in the blue coat. You have heard friend Filer. What do you say? What's it possible to say? returned the gentleman. What is to be said? Who can take any interest in a fellow like this? meaning Trotty, in such degenerate times as these. Look at him. What an object. The good old times. The grand old times. The great old times. Those were the times for a bold peasantry. And all that sort of thing. Those were the times for every sort of thing, in fact. There's nothing nowadays. Ah, sighed the red-faced gentleman, the good old times, the good old times. It is possible that poor Trotty's faith in these very vague old times was not entirely destroyed, for he felt vague enough at that moment. One thing, however, was plain to him, in the midst of his distress to wit, that however these gentlemen might differ in details, his misgivings of that morning, and of many other mornings, were well founded. No, no, we can't go right or do right, thought Trotty in despair. There is no good in us. We are born bad. But Trotty had a father's heart within him, which had somehow got into his breast in spite of this decree, and he could not bear that Meg, in the blush of her brief joy, should have her fortune read by these wise gentlemen. God help her, thought poor Trotty. She will know it soon enough. He anxiously signed, therefore, to the young smith, to take her away. But he was so busy, talking to her softly at a little distance, that he only became conscious of this desire, simultaneously with Alderman Cute. Now, the Alderman had not yet had his say, but he was a philosopher too, practical though. Oh, very practical. And, as he had no idea of losing any portion of his audience, he cried, Stop.
Trotty took Meg's hand and drew it through his arm. He didn't seem to know what he was doing, though. Your daughter, eh? said the alderman, chucking her familiarly under the chin. And you're making love to her, are you? said Cute to the young smith. Yes, returned Richard quickly, for he was nettled by the question. And we are going to be married on New Year's Day. What do you mean? cried Filer sharply. Married? Why, yes, we were thinking of it. Master, said Richard, we're rather in a hurry, you see, in case it should be put down first. Ah, cried Filer with a groan. Put that down indeed. Alderman, and you'll do something. Married. Married. The ignorance of the first principles of political economy on the part of these people, their improvidence, their wickedness is by heavens. Enough to. Now look at that couple, will you? Well, they were worth looking at. And marriage seemed as reasonable and fair a deed as they need have in contemplation. A man may live to be as old as Methuselah, said Mr. Filer, and may labor all his life for the benefit of such people as those, and may heap up facts on figures, facts on figures, facts on figures, mountains high and dry, and he can no more hope to persuade them that they have no right or business to be married then he can hope to persuade him that they have no earthly right or business to be born, and that we know they haven't. We reduced that to a mathematical certainty long ago. Come here, my girl, said Alderman Cute. The young blood of her lover had been mounting, wrathfully, within the last few minutes, and he was indisposed to let her come. But setting a constraint upon himself, he came forward with a stride as Meg approached and stood beside her. Trotty kept her hand within his arm still, but looked from face to face as wildly as a sleeper in a dream. Now, I'm going to give you a word or two of good advice, my girl, said the alderman in his nice, easy way. It's my place to give advice, you know, because I'm a justice. You know I'm a justice, don't you? Meg timidly said, Yes, but everybody knew Alderman Cute was a justice. Oh dear, so active a justice always. Who such a mote of brightness in the public eye as Cute? You are going to be married, you say pursued the alderman. Very unbecoming and indelicate in one of your sex. But never mind that. After you're married, you'll quarrel with your husband and come to be a distressed wife. You may think not, but you will, because I tell you so. Now, I give you fair warning that I have made up my mind put distressed wives down. So, don't be brought before me. You'll have children, boys. Those boys will grow up bad, of course, and run wild in the streets without shoes or stockings. Mind, my young friend, I'll convict them summarily everyone for I am determined to put boys without shoes or stockings down. Perhaps your husband will die young, most likely, and leave you with a baby. Then you'll be turned out of doors and wander up and down the streets. Now don't wander near me, my dear, for I am resolved to put all wandering mothers down. 
all young mothers, of all sorts and kinds, it's my determination to put down. Don't think to plead illness as an excuse with me, or babies, as an excuse with me for all sick persons and young children. I hope you know the church service, but I'm afraid not. I am determined to put down. And if you attempt, desperately and ungratefully and impiously and fraudulently attempt to drown yourself or hang yourself, I'll have no pity on you, for I have made up my mind to put all suicide down. If there is one thing, said the alderman, with his self-satisfied smile, on which I can be said to have made up my mind more than on another, it is to put suicide down. So don't try it on. That's the phrase, isn't it? Ha <laughs> ha. Now we understand each other. Toby knew not whether to be agonized or glad to see that Meg had turned deadly white and dropped her lover's hand. As for you, you dull dog, said the alderman, turning with even increased cheerfulness and urbanity to the young smith. What are you thinking of being married for? What do you want to be married for, you silly fellow? If I was a fine, young, strapping chap like you, I should be ashamed of being milksop enough to pin myself to a woman's apron strings. Why, she'll be an old woman before you're a middle-aged man. And a pretty figure you'll cut then, with a draggle-tailed wife and a crowd of squalling children crying after you wherever you go. Oh, he knew how to banter the common people, Alderman Cute. There. Go along with you, said the alderman, and repent. Don't make such a fool of yourself as to get married on New Year's Day. You'll think very differently of it long before next New Year's Day. A trim young fellow like you, with all the girls looking after you. There, go along with you. They went along. Not arm in arm, or hand in hand, or interchanging bright glances. But she in tears, he gloomy and down-looking. Were these the hearts that had so lately made old Toby's leap up from its faintness? No, no. The alderman, a blessing on his head, had put them down. As you happen to be here, said the alderman to Toby, you shall carry a letter for me. Can you be quick? You're an old man. Toby who had been looking after Meg, quite stupidly, made shift to murmur out that he was very quick and very strong. How old are you? inquired the alderman. I am over sixty, sir, said Toby. Oh, this man's a great deal past the average age, you know, cried Mr. Filer breaking in as if his patience would bear some trying. But this was really carrying matters a little too far. I feel I'm intruding, sir, said Toby. I, I misdoubted it this morning. Oh, dear me. The alderman cut him short by giving him the letter from his pocket. Toby would have got a shilling, too but Mr. Filer clearly showing that, in that case, he would rob a certain given number of persons of ninepence halfpenny apiece. He only got sixpence, and thought himself very well off to get that. Then the alderman gave an arm to each of his friends, and walked off in high feather, but he immediately came hurrying back alone, 
as if he had forgotten something. Porter, said the alderman. Sir, said Toby, take care of that daughter of yours. She's much too handsome. Even her good looks are stolen from somebody or other, I suppose, thought Toby, looking at the sixpence in his hand and thinking of the tripe. She's been and robbed five hundred ladies of a bloom apiece. I shouldn't wonder. It's very dreadful. She's much too handsome, my man, repeated the alderman. The chances are that she'll come to no good, I clearly see. Observe what I say. Take care of her. With which he hurried off again. Wrong every way. Wrong every way, said Trotty, clasping his hands. Born bad, no business here. The chimes came clashing in upon him as he said the last words. Full, loud, and sounding, but with no encouragement. No, not a drop. The tunes changed, cried the old man, as he listened. There's not a word of all that fancy in it. Why should there be? I have no business with the new year, nor with the old one neither. Let me die. Still the bells, peeling forth their changes, made the very air spin. Put him down. Put him down. Good old times. Good old times. Facts and figures. Facts and figures. Put him down. Put him down. If they said anything, they said this, until the brain of Toby reeled. He pressed his bewildered head between his hands, as if to keep it from splitting asunder. A well-timed action, as it happened for finding the letter in one of them, and being by that means reminded of his charge, he fell mechanically into his usual trot and trotted off. Second Quarter The letter Toby had received from Alderman Cute was addressed to a great man in the great district of the town. The greatest district of the town. It must have been the greatest district of the town because it was commonly called the world by its inhabitants. The year was old that day. The patient year had lived through the reproaches and misuses of its slanderers, and faithfully performed its work. Spring, summer, autumn, winter. It had labored through the destined round, and now, laid down its weary head to die. Trotty had no portion to his thinking in the new year or the old. Put him down, put him down. Facts and figures, facts and figures. Good old times, good old times. Put him down, put him down. His trot went to that measure and would fit itself to nothing else. But even that one, melancholy as it was, brought him, in due time, to the end of his journey, to the mansion of Sir Joseph Bowley, Member of Parliament. The door was opened by a porter, such a porter, not of Toby's order, Quite another thing. His place was the ticket, though not Toby's. This porter underwent some hard panting before he could speak, having breathed himself by coming incautiously out of his chair, without first taking time to think about it and compose his mind. 
when he had found his voice, which it took him some time to do, for it was a long way off and hidden under a load of meat. He said in a fat whisper, Who's it from? Toby told him. You're to take it in yourself, said the porter, pointing to a room at the end of a long passage, opening from the hall. Everything goes straight in on this day of the year. You're not a bit too soon, for the carriage is at the door now, and they have only come to town for a couple of hours. A purpose. Toby wiped his feet, which were quite dry already, with great care, and took the way pointed out to him, observing as he went that it was an awfully grand house, but hushed and covered up, as if the family were in the country. Knocking at the room door, he was told to enter from within, and doing so found himself in a spacious library, where, at a table strewn with files and papers, were a stately lady in a bonnet, and a not very stately gentleman in black, who wrote from her dictation while another, and an older, and a much statelier gentleman, whose hat and cane were on the table, walked up and down with one hand in his breast, and looked complacently from time to time at his own picture. A full length, a very full length, hanging over the fireplace. What is this? said the last named gentleman. Mr. Fish, will you have the goodness to attend? Mr. Fish begged pardon, and taking the letter from Toby, handed it with great respect. From Alderman Cute, Sir Joseph, is this all? Have you nothing else, Porter? inquired Sir Joseph. Toby replied in the negative. You have no bill or demand upon me. My name is Bowley, Sir Joseph Bowley. Of any kind from anybody, have you, said Sir Joseph. If you have, present it. There is a checkbook by the side of Mr. Fish. I allow nothing to be carried into the new year. Every description of account is settled in this house at the close of the old one, so that if death was to, to, to cut, suggested Mr. Fish. To sever, sir, returned Sir Joseph, with great asperity, the cord of existence. My affairs would be found, I hope, in a state of preparation. My dear Sir Joseph, said the lady, who was greatly younger than the gentleman. How shocking! My lady Bowley, returned Sir Joseph, floundering now and then, as in the great depth of his observations, at this season of the year, we should think of, of, ourselves. We should look into our, our accounts. We should feel that every return of so eventful a period in human transactions involves matter of deep moment between a man and his, and his banker. Sir Joseph delivered these words as if he felt the full morality of what he was saying, and desired that even Trotty should have an opportunity of being improved by such discourse. Possibly he had this end before him in still forbearing to break the seal of the letter, and in telling Trotty to wait where he was a minute. I am the poor man's friend, observed Sir Joseph, glancing at the poor man present. As such, I may be taunted. As such, I have been taunted. But I ask no other title. Bless him for a noble gentleman thought Trotty. I don't agree with Cute here, for instance, said Sir Joseph, holding out the letter. 
I don't agree with the filer party. I don't agree with any party. My friend, the poor man, has no business with anything of that sort, and nothing of that sort has any business with him. My friend, the poor man, in my district, is my business. No man or body of men has any right to interfere between my friend and me. That is the ground I take. I assume, ah, uh, a paternal character toward my friend. I say, my good fellow, I will treat you paternally. With that great sentiment, he opened the alderman's letter and read it. Very polite and attentive, I am sure, exclaimed Sir Joseph. My lady, the alderman is so obliging as to remind me that he has had the distinguished honor. He is very good of meeting me at the house of our mutual friend Deedles, the banker, and he does me the favor to inquire whether it will be agreeable to me to have Will Fern put down, the banker, and he does me the favor to inquire whether it will be agreeable to me to have Will Fern put down. He came up to London, it seems, to look for employment, trying to better himself, that's his story, and being found at night asleep in a shed was taken into custody and carried next morning before the alderman. The alderman observes very properly that he is determined to put this sort of thing down, and that if it will be agreeable to me to have Will Fern put down, he will be happy to begin with him. Let him be made an example of, by all means, returned the lady. Last winter, when I introduced pinking and eyelet holing among the men and boys in the village as a nice evening employment, and had the lines, Oh, let us love our occupations, bless the squire and his relations, live upon our daily rations, and always know our proper stations, set to music on the new system, for them to sing the while this very fern, I see him now, touched that hat of his, and said, I humbly ask your pardon, my lady, but ain't I something different from a great girl? I expected it, of course. Who can expect anything but insolence and ingratitude from that class of people? That is not to the purpose, however. Sir Joseph, make an example of him. Trotty, who had long ago relapsed and was very low-spirited, stepped forward with a rueful face to take the letter Sir Joseph held out to him. You have heard, perhaps, said Sir Joseph, oracularly, certain remarks into which I have been led respecting the solemn period of time at which we have arrived, and the duty imposed upon us of settling our affairs and being prepared. Now, my friend, can you lay your hand upon your heart and say that you also have made preparation for a new year? I am afraid, sir, stammered Trotty, looking meekly at him, that I am a, a little behindhand with the world. Behindhand with the world, repeated Sir Joseph Bowley in a tone of terrible distinctness. I am afraid, sir, faltered Trotty, that there's a matter of ten or twelve shillings owing to Mrs. Chickenstalker. To Mrs. Chickenstalker, repeated Sir Joseph, in the same tone as before. A shop, sir, exclaimed Toby, in the general line. 
also a, a little money on account of rent. A very little, sir. It oughtn't to be owing, I know. But we have been hard put to it, indeed. Sir Joseph looked at his lady, and at Mr. Fish, and at Trotty, one after another, twice, all round. He then made a despondent gesture with both hands at once, as if he gave the thing up altogether. How a man, even among this improvident and impracticable race, an old man, a man grown gray, can look a new year in the face with his affairs in this condition, how he can lie down on his bed at night and get up again in the morning, and there, he said, turning his back on Trotty, take the letter, take the letter. I heartily wish it was otherwise, sir, said Trotty, anxious to excuse himself. We have been tried very hard. Sir Joseph still repeating, Take the letter, take the letter. And Mr. Fish not only saying the same thing, but giving additional force to the request by motioning the bearer to the door. He had nothing for it but to make his bow and leave the house. And in the street, poor Trotty pulled his worn old hat down on his head to hide the grief he felt at getting no hold on the new year anywhere. He didn't even lift his hat to look up at the bell tower when he came to the old church on his return. He halted there a moment from habit and knew that it was growing dark, and that the steeple rose above him indistinct and faint in the murky air. He knew, too, that the chimes would ring immediately, and that they sounded to his fancy at such a time like voices in the clouds. But he only made the more haste to deliver the alderman's letter and get out of the way before they began for he dreaded to hear them tagging friends and fathers, friends and fathers, to the burden they had rung out last. Toby discharged himself of his commission, therefore, with all possible speed, and set off trotting homeward. But what with his pace, which was at best an awkward one in the street, and what with his hat, which didn't improve it, he trotted against somebody in less than no time and was sent staggering out into the road. I beg your pardon, I'm sure, said Trotty, pulling up his hat in great confusion. And between the hat and the torn lining, fixing his head into a kind of beehive, I hope I haven't hurt you. As to hurting anybody, Toby was not such an absolute Samson, but that he was much more likely to be hurt himself. And indeed, he had flown out into the road like a shuttlecock. He had such an opinion of his own strength, however, that he was in real concern for the other party, and said again, I hope I haven't hurt you. The man against whom he had run a sun-browned, sinewy, country-looking man, with grizzled hair and a rough chin, stared at him for a moment, as if he suspected him to be in jest. But, satisfied of his good faith, he answered, No, friend, you have not hurt me. Nor the child, I hope, said Trotty. Nor the child, returned the man. I thank you kindly. As he said so, he glanced at a little girl he carried in his arms, asleep, and shading her face with the long end of the poor handkerchief he wore about his throat, went slowly on. The tone in which he said, I thank you kindly, penetrated Trotty's heart. He was so jaded and footsore, 
and so soiled with travel, and looked about him so forlorn and strange, that it was a comfort to him to be able to thank anyone, no matter for how little. Toby stood gazing after him as he plodded wearily away, with the child's arm clinging round his neck, at the figure in the worn shoes, now the very shade and ghost of shoes, rough leather leggings, common frock, and broad slouched hat. Trotty stood gazing, blind to the whole street, and at the child's arm, clinging round its neck. Before he merged into the darkness, the traveler stopped, and looking round and seeing Trotty standing there yet, seemed undecided whether to return or go on. After doing first the one and then the other, he came back, and Trotty went halfway to meet him. You can tell me, perhaps, said the man with a faint smile. And if you can, I am sure will, and I'd rather ask you than another, where Alderman Cute lives. Close at hand, replied Toby. I'll show you his house with pleasure. I was to have gone to him elsewhere tomorrow, said the man, accompanying Toby. But I am uneasy under suspicion, and want to clear myself, and to be free to go and seek my bread. I don't know where. So, maybe he'll forgive my going to his house tonight. It's impossible, cried Toby with a start, that your name's Fern. Eh? cried the other, turning on him in astonishment. Fern. Will Fern, said Trotty. That's my name, replied the other. Why then, cried Trotty, seizing him by the arm and looking cautiously round. For heaven's sake, don't go to him. Don't go to him. He'll put you down as sure as ever you were born. Here, come up this alley, and I'll tell you what I mean. Don't go to him. His new acquaintance looked as if he thought him mad, but he bore him company, nevertheless. When they were shrouded from observation, Trotty told him what he knew, and what character he had received, and all about it. The subject of his history listened to it with a calmness that surprised him. He did not contradict or interrupt it once. He nodded his head now and then, more in corroboration of an old and worn-out story, it appeared, than in refutation of it, and once or twice threw back his hat and passed his freckled hand over a brow, where every furrow he had plowed seemed to have set its image in little. But he did no more. It's true enough in the main, he said, Master, I could sift grain from the husk here and there, but let it be as tis. What odds? I have gone against his plans to my misfortune. I can't help it. I should do the like tomorrow. As to character, them gentlefolks will search and search, and pry and pry, and have it as free from spot or speck in us, afore they'll help us to a dry good word. Well, I hope they don't lose good opinion as easy as we do, or their lives is strict indeed, and hardly worth the keeping. For myself, master, I never took with that hand, holding it before him, what wasn't my own, and never held it back from work, however hard. Or poorly paid. Whoever can deny it, let him chop it off. But when work won't maintain me like a human creeter, when my living is so bad that I am hungry, out of doors, and in 
when I see a whole working life begin that way, go on that way, and end that way, without a chance or change, then I say to the gentle folks, keep away from me, let my cottage be. My doors is dark enough without your darkening of them more. Don't look for me to come up into the park to help the show when there's a birthday or a fine speech making or what not. Act your plays and games without me and be welcome to them and enjoy them. We've now to do with one another. I'm best let alone. Seeing that the child in his arms had opened her eyes and was looking about in wonder, he checked himself to say a word or two of foolish prattle in her ear and stand her on the ground beside him. Then, slowly winding one of her long tresses round and round his rough forefinger like a ring, while she hung about his dusty leg, he said to Trotty, I'm not a cross-grained man by nature, I believe, and easy satisfied, I'm sure. I bear no ill will against none of them. I only want to live like one of the Almighty's creatures. I can't. I don't. And so, there's a pit dug between me and them that can and do. There's others like me. You might tell them off by hundreds and by thousands, sooner than by ones. Trotty knew that he spoke the truth in this and shook his head to signify as much. I've got a bad name this way, said Fern, and I'm not likely, I'm afeard, to get a better. Tant lawful to be out of sorts and I am out of sorts, though God knows I'd sooner bear a cheerful spirit if I could. Well, I don't know as this alderman could hurt me much by sending me to jail, but without a friend to speak a word for me, he might do it, and you see, pointing downward with his finger at the child, he sunk his voice so low and gazed upon her with an air so stern and strange that Toby, to divert the current of his thoughts, inquired if his wife were living. I never had one, he returned, shaking his head. She's my brother's child, an orphan, nine-year-old, though you'd hardly think it but she's tired and worn out now. They'd have taken care on her, in the Union, eight and twenty mile away from where we live, between four walls, as they took care of my old father when he couldn't work no more, though he didn't trouble him long. But I took her instead, and she's lived with me ever since. Her mother had a friend once, in London here, we are trying to find her, and to find work too, but it's a large place. Never mind. More room for us to walk about in, Lily. Meeting the child's eyes with a smile which melted Toby more than tears, he shook him by the hand. I don't so much as know your name, he said, but I've opened my heart free to you for I'm thankful to you with good reason. I'll take your advice and keep clear of this. Justice, suggested Toby. Ah, he said. If that's the name they give him, this justice. And tomorrow we'll try whether there's better fortune to be met with somewheres near London. Good night. A happy new year. Stay, cried Trotty, catching at his hand as he relaxed his grip. Stay. The new year never can be happy to me.
if we part like this. The new year can never be happy to me. If I see the child and you go wandering away, you don't know where, without a shelter for your heads. Come home with me. I'm a poor man, living in a poor place, but I can give you lodging for one night and never miss it. Come home with me. Here, I'll take her, cried Trotty, lifting up the child. A pretty one. I'd carry twenty times her weight and never know I'd got it. Tell me if I go too quick for you. I'm very fast. I always was. Trotty said this, taking about six of his trotting paces to one stride of his fatigued companion, and with his thin legs quivering again beneath the load he bore. Down the mews here, Uncle Will, and step at the black door with T. Vec, ticket porter, wrote upon a board. And here we are, and here we go, and here we are indeed, my precious Meg, surprising you. With which words, Trotty, in a breathless state, set the child down before his daughter in the middle of the floor. The little visitor looked once at Meg, and doubting nothing in that face, but trusting everything she saw, there ran into her arms. Here we are, and here we go, cried Trotty, running round the room and choking audibly. Here, Uncle Will, here's a fire, you know. Why don't you come to the fire? Oh, here we are, and here we go. Meg, my precious darling, where's the kettle? Here it is, and here it goes, and it'll bile in no time. Trotty really had picked up the kettle somewhere or other in the course of his wild career, and now put it on the fire, while Meg, seating the child in a warm corner, knelt down on the ground before her and pulled off her shoes and dried her wet feet on a cloth. Aye, and she laughed at Trotty too, so pleasantly, so cheerfully, that Trotty could have blessed her where she kneeled, for he had seen that, when they entered, she was sitting by the fire in tears. Why, father, said Meg, you're crazy tonight. I think. I don't know what the bells would say to that. Meg looked toward him and saw that he had elaborately stationed himself behind the chair of their male visitor, where with many mysterious gestures he was holding up the sixpence he had earned. I see, my dear, said Trotty, as I was coming in. Half an ounce of tea lying somewhere on the stairs. And I'm pretty sure there was a bit of bacon, too. As I don't remember where it was exactly, I'll go myself and try to find him. With this inscrutable artifice, Toby withdrew to purchase the viands he had spoken of, for ready money, at Mrs. Chickenstalker's, and presently came back pretending that he had not been able to find them, at first in the dark. But here they are at last, said Trotty, setting out the tea things, all correct. I was pretty sure it was tea in a rasher. So it is. Meg, my pet, if you'll just make the tea while your unworthy father toasts the bacon, we shall be ready immediate. It's a curious circumstance, said Trotty, proceeding in his cookery, with the assistance of the toasting fork. Curious, but well known to my friends, that I never care myself for rashers, nor for tea. 
I like to see other people enjoy him, said Trotty, speaking very loud to impress the fact upon his guest. But to me, as food, they are disagreeable. Yet Trotty sniffed the savor of the hissing bacon. Ah, as if he liked it. And when he poured the boiling water in the teapot, looked lovingly down into the depths of that snug cauldron, and suffering the fragrant steam to curl about his nose and wreathe his head and face in a thick cloud. However, for all this, he neither ate nor drank, except at the very beginning, a mere morsel for form's sake, which he appeared to eat with infinite relish, but declared was perfectly uninteresting to him. Now, I'll tell you what, said Trotty after tea. The little one, she sleeps with Meg, I know. With good Meg, cried the child, caressing her. With Meg. That's right, said Trotty. And I shouldn't wonder if she'll kiss Meg's father, won't she? I'm Meg's father. Mightily delighted Trotty was when the child went timidly toward him and having kissed him, fell back upon Meg again. Meg looked toward their guest, who leaned upon her chair and with his face turned from her, fondled the child's head, half hidden in her lap. To be sure, said Toby. To be sure. I don't know what I am rambling on about tonight. My wits are wool-gathering, I think. Will Fern, you come along with me. You're tired to death and broken down for want of rest. You come along with me. The hand released from the child's hair had fallen, trembling, into Trotty's hand. So Trotty, talking without intermission, led him out as tenderly and easily as if he had been a child himself. Returning before Meg, he listened for an instant at the door of her little chamber an adjoining room. The child was murmuring a simple prayer before lying down to sleep, and when she had remembered Meg's name, dearly, dearly, so her words ran, Trotty heard her stop and ask for his. It was some short time before the foolish little old fellow could compose himself to mend the fire and draw his chair to the warm hearth. But when he had done so, and had trimmed the light, he took his newspaper from his pocket and began to read. Carelessly at first, and skimming up and down the columns, but with an earnest and a sad attention, very soon. For this same dreaded paper redirected Trotty's thoughts into the channel they had taken all that day and which the day's events had so marked out and shaped. His interest in the two wanderers had set him on another course of thinking, and a happier one, for the time but being alone again, and reading of the crimes and violences of the people, he relapsed into his former train. It's too true, all I've heard today, Toby muttered too, just too full of proof, were bad. The chimes took up the words so suddenly, burst out so loud and clear and sonorous that the bells seemed to strike him in his chair. And what was that, they said. Toby Veck, Toby Veck, waiting for you, Toby. Toby Veck, Toby Veck, waiting for you, Toby. Come and see us. Come and see us. Drag him to us. Drag him to us. Haunt and hunt him. 
haunt and hunt him. Break his slumbers, break his slumbers. Toby Veck, Toby Veck, dar open wide. Toby, Toby Veck, Toby Veck, door open wide, Toby. Then fiercely back to their impetuous strain again, and ringing in the very bricks and plaster on the walls. Toby listened. Fancy, fancy. His remorse for having run away from them that afternoon. No, no, nothing of the kind. Again, again, and yet a dozen times again. Haunt and hunt him, haunt and hunt him, drag him to us, drag him to us, deafening the whole town. Meg, said Trotty, softly tapping at her door. Do you hear anything? I hear the bells, father. Surely they're very loud tonight. Is she asleep? said Toby, making an excuse for peeping in. So peacefully and happily. I can't leave her yet, though, father. Look how she holds my hand. Meg, whispered Trotty, listen to the bells. She listened, with her face toward him all the time. But it underwent no change. She didn't understand them. Trotty withdrew, resumed his seat by the fire, and once more listened by himself. He remained here a little time. It was impossible to bear it. Their energy was dreadful. If the tower door is really open, said Toby, hastily laying aside his apron, but never thinking of his hat, what's to hinder me from going up in the steeple and satisfying myself? If it's shut, I don't want any other satisfaction. That's enough. He was pretty certain, as he slipped out quietly into the street, that he should find it shut and locked, for he knew the door well, and had so rarely seen it open that he couldn't reckon above three times in all. It was a low, arched portal outside the church in a dark nook behind a column, and had such great iron hinges and such a monstrous lock that there was more hinge and lock than door. But what was his astonishment when, coming bareheaded to the church and putting his hand into this dark nook, with a certain misgiving that it might be unexpectedly seized, and a shivering propensity to draw it back again. He found that the door, which opened outward, actually stood ajar. He thought, on the first surprise, of going back, or of getting a light, or a companion, but his courage aided him immediately, and he determined to ascend alone. What have I to fear? said Trotty. It's a church. Besides, the ringers may be there and have forgotten to shut the door. So he went in, feeling his way as he went, like a blind man, for it was very dark and very quiet, for the chimes were silent. The dust from the street had blown into the recess, and lying there, heaped up, made it so soft and velvet-like to the foot that there was something startling even in that. The narrow stair was so close to the door, too, that he stumbled at the very first, and shutting the door upon himself by striking it with his foot, and causing it to rebound back heavily, he couldn't open it again. This was another reason, however, for going on. Trotty groped his way, 
and went on. Up, 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 and round, and round, and up, 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 higher, higher, higher up, until, ascending through the floor, and pausing with his head just raised above its beams, he came among the bells. It was barely possible to make out their great shapes in the gloom, but there they were, shadowy and dark and dumb. A heavy sense of dread and loneliness fell instantly upon him as he climbed into this airy nest of stone and metal. His head went round and round. He listened and then raised a wild hello. Hello was mournfully protracted by the echoes. Giddy, confused and out of breath, and frightened, Toby looked about him vacantly and sunk down in a swoon. Third Quarter When and how the darkness of the night-black steeple changed to shining light, and how the solitary tower was peopled with a myriad figures, when and how the whispered haunt and hunt him, breathing monotonously through his sleep or swoon, became a voice exclaiming in the waking ears of Trotty, break his slumbers, when and how, he ceased to have a sluggish and confused idea that such things were, companioning a host of others that were not there are no dates or means to tell, but awake and standing on his feet upon the boards where he had lately lain, he saw this goblin sight. Then, and not before, did Trotty see in every bell a bearded figure of the bulk and stature of the bell? Incomprehensibly, a figure and the bell itself. Gigantic, grave, and darkly watchful of him as he stood rooted to the ground. Mysterious and awful figures resting on nothing poised in the night air of the tower, with their draped and hooded heads merged in the dim roof, motionless and shadowy. Shadowy and dark, although he saw them by some light belonging to themselves, none else was there, each with its muffled hand upon its goblin mouth. He could not plunge down wildly through the opening in the floor, for all power of motion had deserted him. Otherwise, he would have done so. I would have thrown himself, head foremost, from the steeple top, rather than have seen them watching him with eyes that would have waked and watched although the pupils had been taken out, a blast of air. How cold and shrill. Came moaning through the tower. As it died away, the great bell, or the goblin of the great bell, spoke. What visitor is this? it said. The voice was low and deep, and Trotty fancied that it sounded in the other figures as well. I thought my name was called by the chimes, said Trotty, raising his hands in an attitude of supplication. I hardly know why I am here, or how I came. I have listened to the chimes these many years. They have cheered me often. And you have thanked them? said the bell. 
A thousand times, cried Trotty. How? I am a poor man, faltered Trotty, and could only thank them in words. And always so, inquired the goblin of the bell. Have you never done us wrong in words? No, cried Trotty eagerly. Never done us foul and false and wicked wrong in words, pursued the goblin of the bell. Trotty was about to answer never, but he stopped and was confused. The voice of time, said the phantom, cries to man, advance. Time is for his advancement and improvement for his greater worth, his greater happiness, his better life, his progress onward to that goal within its knowledge and its view, and set there in the period when time and he began. Ages of darkness, wickedness, and violence have come and gone. Millions uncountable have suffered, lived, and died to point the way before him. Who seeks to turn him back or stay him on his course arrests a mighty engine which will strike the meddler dead and be the fiercer and the wilder ever for its momentary check. I never did so to my knowledge, sir, said Trotty. It was quite by accident if I did. I wouldn't go to do it, I'm sure. Who puts into the mouth of time, or of its servants, said the goblin of the bell, a cry of lamentation for days which have had their trial and their failure, and have left deep traces of it which the blind may see, a cry that only serves the present time by showing men how much it needs their help when any ears can listen to regrets for such a past. Who does this, does a wrong. And you have done that wrong to us, the chimes. Trotty's first excess of fear was gone, but he had felt tenderly and gratefully toward the bells, as you have seen. And when he heard himself arraigned as one who had offended them so weightily, his heart was touched with penitence and grief. If you knew, said Trotty, clasping his hands earnestly, or perhaps you do know, if you know how often you have kept me company, how often you have cheered me up when I've been low, how you were quite the plaything of my little daughter Meg, almost the only one she ever had, when first her mother died and she and me were left alone. You won't bear malice for a hasty word. Who hears in us the chimes, one note bespeaking disregard or stern regard of any hope or joy or pain or sorrow, of the many sorrowed throng who hears us make response to any creed that gauges human passions and affections, as it gauges the amount of miserable food on which humanity may pine and wither, does us wrong. That wrong you have done us, said the bell. I have, said Trotty. Oh, forgive me. Spare me, cried Trotty, falling on his knees for mercy's sake. Listen, said the shadow. Listen, cried the other shadows. Listen, said a clear and childlike voice, which Trotty thought he recognized as having heard before. 
the organ sounded faintly in the church below. Swelling by degrees, the melody ascended to the roof and filled the choir and nave. Expanding more and more, it rose up, 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 higher, higher, higher up, awakening agitated hearts within the burly piles of oak, the hollow bells, the iron-bound doors, the stairs of solid stone, until the tower walls were insufficient to contain it, and it soared into the sky. No wonder that an old man's breast could not contain a sound so vast and mighty. It broke from that weak prison in a rush of tears, and Trotty put his hands before his face. Listen, said the shadow. Listen, said the other shadows. Listen, said the child's voice. A solemn strain of blended voices rose into the tower. It was a very low and mournful strain, a dirge. And as he listened, Trotty heard his child among the singers. She is dead, exclaimed the old man. Meg is dead. Her spirit calls to me. I hear it. The spirit of your child bewails the dead and mingles with the dead. Dead hopes, dead fancies, dead imaginings of youth return the bell. But she is living. Learn from her life a living truth. Learn from the creature dearest to your heart. How bad the bad are born. See every bud and leaf plucked one by one from off the fairest stem. And know how bare and wretched it may be. Follow her to desperation. Each of the shadowy figures stretched its right arm forth and pointed downward. The spirit of the chimes is your companion, said the figure. Go. It stands behind you. Trotty turned and saw the child. The child Will Fern had carried in the street, the child whom Meg had watched but now, asleep. I carried her myself tonight, said Trotty, in these arms. Show him what he calls himself, said the dark figures, one and all. The tower opened at his feet. He looked down and beheld his own form, lying at the bottom, on the outside crushed and motionless. No more a living man, cried Trotty. Dead, dead, said the figures altogether. Gracious heaven, and the new year passed, said the figures. What, he cried, shuddering. I missed my way and coming on the outside of this tower in the dark, fell down, a year ago, nine years ago, replied the figures. As they gave the answer, they recalled their outstretched hands, and where their figures had been, there the bells were. What are these? he asked his guide. If I am not mad, what are these? Spirits of the bells, their sound upon the air, returned the child. They take such shapes and occupations as the hopes and thoughts of mortals and the recollections they have stored up give them. And you, said Trotty, wildly, what are you? Hush, hush, returned the child. Look here. 
in a poor, mean room working at the same kind of embroidery, which he had often, often seen before her Meg, his own dear daughter, was presented to his view. He made no effort to imprint his kisses on her face. He did not strive to clasp her to his loving heart. He knew that such endearments were, for him, no more. But he held his trembling breath and brushed away the blinding tears, that he might look upon her, that he might only see her. Ah, changed, changed. The light of the clear eye, how dimmed. The bloom, how faded from the cheek. Beautiful she was, as she had ever been. But hope, 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 oh. Where was the fresh hope that had spoken to him like a voice? She looked up from her work at a companion. Following her eyes, the old man started back. In the woman grown, he recognized her at a glance. In the long, silken hair, he saw the self-same curls around the lips, the child's expression lingering still. See. In the eyes, now turned inquiringly on Meg, there shone the very look that scanned those features when he brought her home. Then what was this beside him? Looking with awe into its face, he saw a something reigning there, a lofty something, undefined and indistinct, which made it hardly more than a remembrance of that child, as yonder figure might be. Yet it was the same, the same, and wore the dress. Hark! They were speaking. Meg, said Lillian, hesitating, how often you raise your head from your work to look at me. Are my looks so altered that they frighten you? asked Meg. Nay, dear, but you smile at that yourself. Why not smile when you look at me, Meg? I do so. Do I not? she answered, smiling on her. Now you do, said Lillian, but not usually. When you think I'm busy and don't see you, you look so anxious and so doubtful that I hardly like to raise my eyes. There is little cause for smiling in this hard and toilsome life, but you were once so cheerful. Am I not now? cried Meg, speaking in a tone of strange alarm and rising to embrace her. Do I make our weary life more weary to you, Lillian? You have been the only thing that made it life, said Lillian, fervently kissing her sometimes, the only thing that made me care to live so, Meg. Such work, such work, so many hours, so many days, so many long, long nights of hopeless, cheerless, never-ending work, not to heap up riches, not to live grandly or gaily, not to live upon enough, however coarse, but to earn bare bread to scrape together just enough to toil upon and want upon and keep alive in us the consciousness of our hard fate. Oh, Meg, Meg, she raised her voice and twined her arms about her as she spoke, like one in pain. How can the cruel world go round and bear to look upon such lives? Lily, said Meg, soothing her and putting back her hair from her wet face. Why, Lily, you, so pretty and so young. Oh, Meg, she interrupted holding her at arm's length 
and looking in her face imploringly. The worst of all. The worst of all. Strike me old, Meg. Wither me and shrivel me and free me from the dreadful thoughts that tempt me in my youth. Trotty turned to look upon his guide, but the spirit of the child had taken flight, was gone. Fourth Quarter Some new remembrance of the ghostly figures in the bells, some faint impression of the ringing of the chimes, some giddy consciousness of having seen the swarm of phantoms reproduced, and reproduced until the recollection of them lost itself in the confusion of their numbers. Some hurried knowledge, how conveyed to him he knew not that more years had passed, and Trotty, with the spirit of the child attending him, stood looking on at mortal company, fat company, rosy-cheeked company, comfortable company. They were but two, but they were red enough for ten. They sat before a bright fire, with a small low table between them, and unless the fragrance of hot tea and muffins lingered longer in that room than in most others, the table had seen service very lately. But all the cups and saucers being clean, and in their proper places in the corner cupboard, and the brass toasting fork hanging in its usual nook, and spreading its four idle fingers out, as if it wanted to be measured for a glove, there remained no other visible tokens of the meal just finished than such as purred and washed their whiskers in the person of the basking cat, and glistened in the gracious, not to say the greasy faces of her patrons. This cozy couple, married evidently, had made a fair division of the fire between them, and sat looking at the glowing sparks that dropped into the grate, now nodding off into a doze, now waking up again, when some hot fragment, larger than the rest, came rattling down, as if the fire were coming with it. It was in no danger of sudden extinction, however, for it gleamed not only in the little room and on the panes of window glass in the door and on the curtain half drawn across them, but in the little shop beyond. A little shop, quite crammed and choked with the abundance of its stock, a perfectly voracious little shop, with a maw as accommodating and full as any shark's. Cheese, butter, firewood, soap, pickles, matches, bacon, table beer, peg tops, sweetmeats, boys' kites, bird seed, cold ham, birch brooms, hearthstones, salt, vinegar, blacking, red herrings, stationery, lard, mushroom ketchup, stay laces, loaves of bread, shuttlecocks, eggs, and slate pencils. Everything was fish that came to the net of this greedy little shop, and all articles were in its net. Glancing at such of these items, as were visible in the shining of the blaze and the less cheerful radiance of two smoky lamps, which burnt but dimly in the shop itself, as though its plethora sat heavy on their lungs and glancing. Then, 
at one of the two faces by the parlor fire. Trotty had small difficulty in recognizing in the stout old lady, Mrs. Chickenstalker, always inclined to corpulency, even in the days when he had known her as established in the general line, and having a small balance against him in her books. The features of her companion were less easy to him. The great, broad chin, with creases in it, large enough to hide a finger in the astonished eyes that seemed to expostulate with themselves for sinking deeper and deeper into the yielding fat of the soft face, the nose afflicted with that disordered action of its functions, which is generally termed the snuffles, the short, thick throat, and laboring chest, with other beauties of the like description, though calculated to impress the memory. Trotty could at first allot to nobody he had ever known. And yet, he had some recollection of them, too. At length, in Mrs. Chickenstalker's partner in the general line, and in the crooked and eccentric line of life, he recognized the former porter of Sir Joseph Bowley, an apoplectic innocent, who had connected himself in Trotty's mind with Mrs. Chickenstalker years ago by giving him admission to the mansion where he had confessed his obligations to that lady and drawn on his unlucky head such grave reproach. Trotty had little interest in a change like this, after the changes he had seen. But association is very strong sometimes. And he looked involuntarily behind the parlor door, where the accounts of credit customers were usually kept in chalk. There was no record of his name. Some names were there but they were strange to him, and infinitely fewer than of old, from which he argued that the porter was an advocate of ready money transactions, and on coming into the business, had looked pretty sharp after the chicken stalker defaulters. So desolate was Trotty, and so mournful for the youth and promise of his blighted child, that it was a sorrow to him even to have no place in Mrs. Chickenstalker's ledger. What sort of a night is it, Anne? inquired the former porter of Sir Joseph Bowley, stretching out his legs before the fire, and rubbing as much of them as his short arms could reach with an air that added, Here I am, if it's bad, and I don't want to go out if it's good. Hard weather, indeed, returned his wife, shaking her head. Aye, aye, years, said Mr. Tugby, are like Christians in that respect. Some of them die hard, some of them die easy. This one hasn't many days to run, and is making a fight for it. I like him all the better. There's a customer, my love. Attentive to the rattling door, Mrs. Tugby had already risen. Now then, said that lady, passing out into the little shop, what's wanted? Oh, I beg your pardon, sir, I'm sure. I didn't think it was you. She made this apology to a gentleman in black, who, with his wristbands tucked up, and his hat cocked loungingly on one side, and his hand in his pocket, sat down astride on the table beer barrel, and nodded in return. This is a bad business upstairs, Mrs. Tugby, said the gentleman. The man can't live. Not the back attic can't. 
cried Tugby, coming out into the shop to join the conference. The back attic, Mr. Tugby, said the gentleman, is coming downstairs fast, and will be below the basement very soon. Looking by turns at Tugby and his wife, he sounded the barrel with his knuckles for the depth of beer, and having found it, played a tune upon the empty part. The back attic, Mr. Tugby, said the gentleman. Tugby, having stood in silent consternation for some time, is going. Then, said Tugby, turning to his wife, he must go, you know, before he's gone. I don't think you can move him, said the gentleman, shaking his head. I wouldn't take the responsibility of saying it could be done myself. You had better leave him where he is. He can't live long. It's the only subject, said Tugby, bringing the butter scale down upon the counter with a crash by weighing his fist on it, that we've ever had a word upon she and me, and look what it comes to. He's going to die here, after all. Going to die upon the premises. Going to die in our house. And where should he have died, Tugby, cried his wife. In the workhouse, he returned. What are workhouses made for? Not for that, said Mrs. Tugby with great energy. Not for that. Neither did I marry you for that. Don't think it, Tugby. I won't have it. I won't allow it. I'd be separated first and never see your face again. When my widow's name stood over that door, as it did for many, many years, the house being known as Mrs. Chickenstalker's far and wide, and never known but to its honest credit and its good report. When my widow's name stood over that door, Tugby, I knew him as a handsome, steady, manly, independent youth. I knew her as the sweetest-looking, sweetest-tempered girl eyes ever saw. I knew her father. Poor old creeter. He fell down from the steeple walking in his sleep and killed himself. For the simplest, hardest working, childest hearted man that ever drew the breath of life. And when I turn them out of house and home, may angels turn me out of heaven. As they would and serve me right. Her old face, which had been a plump and dimpled one before the changes which had come to pass, seemed to shine out of her as she said these words. And when she dried her eyes and shook her head and her handkerchief at Tugby, with an expression of firmness which it was quite clear was not to be easily resisted. Trotty said, Bless her, bless her. Then he listened with a panting heart for what should follow, knowing nothing yet but that they spoke of Meg. The gentleman upon the table beer cask who appeared to be some authorized medical attendant upon the poor, was far too well accustomed, evidently, to little differences of opinion between man and wife to interpose any remark in this instance. He sat softly whistling and turning little drops of beer out of the tap upon the ground until there was a perfect calm. When he raised his head and said to Mrs. Tugby, late chicken stalker, there's something interesting about the woman, even now. How did she come to marry him? Why, that, said Mrs. Tugby, 
taking a seat near him, is not the least cruel part of her story, sir. You see, they kept company, she and Richard, many years ago. When they were a young and beautiful couple, everything was settled, and they were to have been married on a New Year's Day. But somehow, Richard got it into his head, through what the gentleman told him, that he might do better, and that he'd soon repent it, and that she wasn't good enough for him, and that a young man of spirit had no business to be married. And the gentleman frightened her, and made her melancholy, and timid of his deserting her, and of her children coming to the gallows, and of its being wicked to be man and wife, and a good deal more of it. And in short, they lingered and lingered, and their trust in one another was broken. And so, at last, was the match. But the fault was his. She would have married him, sir, joyfully. I've seen her heart swell many times afterwards when he passed her in a proud and careless way, and never did a woman grieve more truly for a man than she for Richard when he first went wrong. Oh, he went wrong, did he? said the gentleman, pulling out the vent peg of the table beer and trying to peep down into the barrel through the hole. Well, sir, I don't know that he rightly understood himself, you see. I think his mind was troubled by their having broke with one another, and that, but for being ashamed before the gentleman, and perhaps for being uncertain too, how she might take it, he'd have gone through any suffering or trial to have had Meg's promise and Meg's hand again. That's my belief. He never said so more's the pity. He took to drinking, idling, bad companions. All the fine resources that were to be so much better for him than the home he might have had. He lost his looks, his character, his health, his strength, his friends, his work, everything. He didn't lose everything, Mrs. Tugby, returned the gentleman because he gained a wife, and I want to know how he gained her. I'm coming to it, sir, in a moment. This went on for years and years, he sinking lower and lower, she enduring, poor thing, miseries enough to wear her life away. At last he was so cast down and cast out that no one would employ or notice him and doors were shut upon him, go where he would. Applying from place to place, and door to door, and coming for the hundredth time to one gentleman, who had often and often tried him. He was a good workman to the very end. That gentleman, who knew his history, said, I believe you are incorrigible, there's only one person in the world who has a chance of reclaiming you. Ask me to trust you no more until she tries to do it. Something like that, in his anger and vexation. Ah, said the gentleman. Well, well, sir, he went to her and kneeled to her, said it was so said it ever had been so and made a prayer to her to save him. And she? Don't distress yourself, Mrs. Tugby. She came to me that night to ask me about living here. What he was once to me, she said, is buried in a grave, side by side with what I was to him. But I have thought of this, and I will make the trial. 
in the hope of saving him for the love of the light-hearted girl, you remember her, who was to have been married on a New Year's Day, and for the love of her Richard. And he said he had come to her from Lillian, and Lillian had trusted to him, and she never could forget that. So they were married, and when they came home here, and I saw them, I hoped that such prophecies as parted them when they were young may not often fulfill themselves as they did in this case, or I wouldn't be the makers of them for a mine of gold. The gentleman got off the cask and stretched himself, observing, I suppose he used her ill as soon as they were married. I don't think he ever did that, said Mrs. Tugby, shaking her head and wiping her eyes. He went on better for a short time, but his habits were too old and strong to be got rid of. He soon fell back a little and was falling fast back when his illness came so strong upon him. I think he has always felt for her. I am sure he has. I've seen him in his crying fits and tremblings, try to kiss her hand, and I've heard him call her Meg, and say it was her nineteenth birthday. There he has been lying now, these weeks and months. Between him and her baby, she has not been able to do her old work, and by not being able to be regular, she has lost it, even if she could have done it. How they have lived, I hardly know. I know, muttered Mr. Tugby, looking at the till, and round the shop, and at his wife, and rolling his head with immense intelligence. He was interrupted by a cry a sound of lamentation from the upper story of the house. The gentleman moved hurriedly to the door. My friend, he said, looking back, you needn't discuss whether he shall be removed or not. He has spared you that trouble, I believe. Saying so, he ran upstairs, followed by Mrs. Tugby, while Mr. Tugby panted and grumbled after them at leisure. Being rendered more than commonly short-winded by the weight of the till, in which there had been an inconvenient quantity of copper. Trotty, with the child beside him, floated up the staircase like mere air. Follow her, follow her, follow her. He heard the ghostly voices in the bells repeat their words as he ascended. Learn it from the creature dearest to your heart. It was over. It was over. And this was she, her father's pride and joy. This haggard, wretched woman weeping by the bed if it deserved that name, and pressing to her breast, and hanging down her head upon an infant. Who can tell how spare, how sickly, and how poor an infant? Who can tell how dear? Thank God, cried Trotty, holding up his folded hands. Oh, God be thanked, she loves her child. Again, Trotty heard the voices saying, follow her. He turned toward his guide and saw it rising from him, passing through the air. Follow her, it said, and vanished. He hovered round her, sat down at her feet, looked up into her face for one trace of her old self, listened for one note of her old, 
pleasant voice. He flitted round the child. So wan, so prematurely old, so dreadful in its gravity, so plaintive in its feeble, mournful, miserable wail. He almost worshipped it. He clung to it as her only safeguard, as the last unbroken link that bound her to endurance. He set his father's hope and trust on the frail baby, watched her every look upon it as she held it in her arms, and cried a thousand times, She loves it. God be thanked. She loves it. He saw the woman tend her in the night return to her when her grudging husband was asleep, and all was still encourage her. Shed tears with her, set nourishment before her. He saw the day come, and the night again the day, the night the time go by the house of death, relieved of death the room left to herself, and to the child, he heard it moan and cry, he saw it harass her and tire her out, and when she slumbered in exhaustion, drag her back to consciousness, and hold her with its little hands upon the rack, but she was constant to it, gentle with it, patient with it. Patient. Was its loving mother in her inmost heart and soul, and had its being knitted up with hers, as when she carried it unborn? All this time, she was in want, languishing away in dire and pining want. With the baby in her arms, she wandered here and there in quest of occupation, and with its thin face lying in her lap and looking up in hers, did any work for any wretched sum a day and night of labor for as many farthings as there were figures on the dial. If she had quarreled with it, if she had neglected it, if she had looked upon it with a moment's hate, if, in the frenzy of an instant, she had struck it. No, his comfort was, she loved it always, she told no one of her extremity, and wandered abroad in the day, lest she should be questioned by her only friend, for any help she received from her hands, occasioned fresh disputes between the good woman and her husband, and it was new bitterness to be the daily cause of strife and discord, where she owed so much. She loved it still, she loved it more and more. But a change fell on the aspect of her love. One night, she was singing faintly to it in its sleep, and walking to and fro to hush it, when her door was softly opened, and a man looked in. For the last time, he said, William Fern, for the last time. He listened like a man pursued and spoke in whispers. Margaret, my race is nearly run. I couldn't finish it without a parting word with you, without one grateful word. What have you done? she asked, regarding him with terror. He looked at her, but gave no answer. After a short silence, he made a gesture with his hand, as if he set her question by, as if he brushed it aside and said, It's long ago, Margaret, now, but that night is as fresh in my memory as ever. Twas. We little thought then, he added, looking round, that we should ever meet like this. Your child, Margaret? Let me have it in my arms. 
let me hold your child. He put his hat upon the floor and took it. And he trembled as he took it from head to foot. Is it a girl? Yes. He put his hand before its little face. See how weak I'm grown, Margaret, when I want the courage to look at it. Let her be a moment. I won't hurt her. It's long ago, but what's her name? Margaret, she answered quickly. I'm glad of that, he said. I'm glad of that. He seemed to breathe more freely, and after pausing for an instant, took away his hand and looked upon the infant's face, but covered it again immediately. Margaret, he said, and gave her back the child. It's Lillian's, Lillian's. I held the same face in my arms when Lillian's mother died and left her. When Lillian's mother died and left her. She repeated wildly, How shrill you speak. Why do you fix your eyes upon me so? Margaret. She sunk down in a chair and pressed the infant to her breast and wept over it. Sometimes she released it from her embrace to look anxiously in its face, then strained it to her bosom again. At those times, when she gazed upon it, then it was that something fierce and terrible began to mingle with her love. Then it was that her old father quailed. Follow her was sounded through the house. Learn it from the creature dearest to your heart. Margaret, said Fern, bending over her and kissing her upon the brow. I thank you for the last time. Good night. Goodbye. Put your hand in mine and tell me you'll forget me from this hour and try to think the end of me was here. She called to him, but he was gone. She sat down stupefied until her infant roused her to a sense of hunger, cold, and darkness. She paced the room with it the livelong night, hushing it and soothing it. She said at intervals, like Lillian, when her mother died and left her. Why was her step so quick, her eyes so wild, her love so fierce and terrible, whenever she repeated those words? But it is love, said Trotty. It is love. She'll never cease to love it. My poor Meg. She dressed the child next morning with unusual care. Ah, vain expenditure of care upon such squalid robes. And once more tried to find some means of life. It was the last day of the old year. She tried till night and never broke her fast. She tried in vain. She mingled with an abject crowd who tarried in the snow until it pleased some officer appointed to dispense the public charity. The lawful charity, not that once preached upon a mount. To call them in and question them and say to this one, Go to such a place, to that one. Come next week to make a football of another wretch and pass him here and there, from hand to hand, from house to house, until he wearied and lay down to die or started up and robbed and so became a higher sort of criminal 
whose claims allowed of no delay. Here, too, she failed. She loved her child and wished to have it lying on her breast. And that was quite enough. It was night, a bleak, dark, cutting night. When pressing the child close to her for warmth, she arrived outside the house she called her home. She was so faint and giddy that she saw no one standing in the doorway until she was close upon it and about to enter. Then she recognized the master of the house, who had so disposed himself, with his person it was not difficult, as to fill up the whole entry. Oh, he said softly, you have come back. She looked at the child and shook her head. Don't you think you have lived here long enough without paying any rent? Don't you think that, without any money, you've been a pretty constant customer at this shop now? said Mr. Tugby. She repeated the same mute appeal. Suppose you try and deal somewhere else, he said. And suppose you provide yourself with another lodging. Come. Don't you think you could manage it? She said in a low voice that it was very late. Tomorrow. Now I see what you want, said Tugby, and what you mean. You know there are two parties in this house about you, and you delight in setting them by the ears. I don't want any quarrels I'm speaking softly to. Avoid a quarrel, but if you don't go away, I'll speak out loud, and you shall cause words loud enough to please you. But you shan't come in, that I am determined. She put her hair back with her hand and looked in a sudden manner at the sky and the dark, lowering distance. This is the last night of an old year, and I won't carry ill blood and quarrelings and disturbances into a new one, to please you nor anybody else, said Tugby, who was quite a retail friend and father. I wonder you ain't ashamed of yourself, to carry such practices into a new year, if you haven't any business in the world, but to be always giving way and always making disturbances between man and wife, you'd be better out of it. Go along with you. Follow her. To desperation. Again, the old man heard the voices. Looking up, he saw the figures hovering in the air and pointing where she went, down the dark street. She loves it. He exclaimed in agonized entreaty for her. Chimes. She loves it still. Follow her. The shadows swept upon the track she had taken like a cloud. Oh, for something to awaken her for any sight or sound or scent to call up tender recollections in a brain on fire, for any gentle image of the past to rise up before her. I was her father. I was her father, cried the old man stretching out his hands to the dark shadows flying on above. Have mercy on her and on me. Where does she go? Turn her back. I was her father. But they only pointed to her as she hurried on to desperation. Learn it from the creature dearest to your heart. A hundred voices echoed it. The air was made of breath expended in those words. He seemed to take them in at every gasp he drew.
They were everywhere and not to be escaped. And still, she hurried on the same light in her eyes. All at once, she stopped. Now, turn her back, exclaimed the old man, tearing his white hair. My child, Meg, turn her back. Great father, turn her back. In her own scanty shawl, she wrapped the baby warm. With her fevered hands, she smoothed its limbs, composed its face, arranged its mean attire. In her wasted arms, she folded it as though she never would resign it more, and with her dry lips, kissed it in a final pang and last long agony of love, putting its tiny hand up to her neck and holding it there within her dress, next to her distracted heart. She set its sleeping face against her, closely, steadily against her, and sped onward to the river. To the rolling river, swift and dim, where winter night sat brooding like the last dark thoughts of many who had sought a refuge there before her. Where scattered lights upon the banks gleamed sullen, red, and dull, as torches that were burning there to show the way to death. Where no abode of living people cast its shadow on the deep, impenetrable, melancholy shade. To the river, to that portal of eternity, her desperate footsteps tended with the swiftness of its rapid waters running to the sea. He tried to touch her as she passed him, going down to its dark level, but the wild, distempered form the fierce and terrible love, the desperation that had left all human check or hold behind, swept by him like the wind. He followed her. She paused a moment on the brink before the dreadful plunge. He fell down on his knees, and in a shriek, addressed the figures in the bells, now hovering above them. Have mercy on her, he exclaimed, as one in whom this dreadful crime has sprung from love, perverted from the strongest, deepest love we fallen creatures know. Think what her misery must have been when such seed bears such fruit. Heaven meant her to be good. There is no loving mother on the earth who might not come to this if such a life had gone before. Oh, have mercy on my child, who, even at this pass, means mercy to her own and dies herself and perils her immortal soul to save it. She was in his arms. He held her now. His strength was like a giant's. He might have said more, but the bells, the old familiar bells, his own dear, constant, steady friends, the chimes, began to ring the joy peals for a new year so lustily, so merrily so happily, so gaily, that he leapt upon his feet and broke the spell that bound him. And whatever you do, father, said Meg, don't eat tripe again without asking some doctor whether it's likely to agree with you for how you have been going on, good gracious. She was working with her needle at the little table by the fire, 
dressing her simple gown with ribbons for her wedding. So quietly happy, so blooming and youthful, so full of beautiful promise, that he uttered a great cry as if it were an angel in his house, then flew to clasp her in his arms. But he caught his feet in the newspaper, which had fallen on the hearth, and somebody came rushing in between them. No, cried the voice of this same somebody, a generous and jolly voice it was. Not even you. Not even you. The first kiss of Meg in the new year is mine. Mine. I have been waiting outside the house this hour to hear the bells and claim it. Meg, my precious prize. A happy year. A life of happy years, my darling wife. And Richard smothered her with kisses. You never in all your life saw anything like Trotty after this. I don't care where you have lived or what you have seen. You never in all your life saw anything at all approaching him. He sat down in his chair and beat his knees and cried. He sat down in his chair and beat his knees and laughed. He sat down in his chair and beat his knees and laughed and cried together. He got out of his chair and hugged Meg. He got out of his chair and hugged Richard. He got out of his chair and hugged them both at once. He kept running up to Meg and squeezing her fresh face between his hands and kissing it going from her backward not to lose sight of it, and running up again like a figure in a magic lantern. And whatever he did, he was constantly sitting himself down in this chair. He was constantly sitting himself down in this chair and never stopping in it for one single moment. Being, that's the truth beside himself with joy. And tomorrow's your wedding day, my pet, cried Trotty. Your real, happy wedding day. Today, cried Richard, shaking hands with him. Today. The chimes are ringing in the new year. Hear them. They were ringing. Bless their sturdy hearts. They were ringing great bells as they were melodious, deep-mouthed, noble bells cast in no common metal, made by no common founder. When had they ever chimed like that before? But today, my pet, said Trotty, you and Richard had some words today. Because he's such a bad fellow, father, said Meg. And you, Richard? Such a headstrong, violent man. He'd have made no more of speaking his mind to that great alderman and putting him down, I don't know where, than he would have. Kissing Meg, suggested Richard. Doing it too. No, not a bit more, said Meg. But I wouldn't let him, father. Where would have been the use? Richard. My boy, cried Trotty. You was turned up, Trumps, originally. And Trumps, you must be until you die. But you were crying by the fire tonight, my pet, when I came home. Why did you cry by the fire? I was thinking of the years we've passed together, father. Only that. And thinking you might miss me and be lonely. Trotty was backing off to that extraordinary chair again when the child, who had been awakened by the noise, came running in, half-dressed. Why, here she is, cried Trotty, catching her up. Here's little Lillian, 
ha, ha, ha. Here we are and here we go. Oh, here we are and here we go again. And here we are and here we go. And Uncle Will, too, stopping in his trot to greet him heartily. Oh, Uncle Will, the vision that I've had tonight through lodging you. Oh, Uncle Will, the obligations that you've laid me under by your coming, my good friend. Before Will Fern could make the least reply, a band of music burst into the room, attended by a flock of neighbors, screaming, A happy new year, Meg. A happy wedding. Many of them. And other fragmentary good wishes of that sort. The drum, who was a private friend of Trotty's, then stepped forward and said, Trotty Veck, my boy, it's got about that your daughter is going to be married tomorrow. There ain't a soul that knows you that don't wish you well, or that knows her and don't wish her well, or that knows you both and don't wish you both all the happiness the new year can bring. And here we are to play it in accordingly. What a happiness it is, I'm sure, said Trotty, to be so esteemed. How kind and neighborly you are. It's all along of my dear daughter. She deserves it. At this moment, a combination of prodigious sounds was heard outside, and a good-humored, comely woman of some fifty years of age or thereabouts came running in, closely followed by the marrow bones and cleavers and the bells. Not the bells, but a portable collection on a frame. Trotty said, it's Mrs. Chickenstalker, and sat down and beat his knees again. Married, and not tell me, Meg, cried the good woman. Never. I couldn't rest on the last night of the old year without coming to wish you joy. I couldn't have done it, Meg, not if I had been bedridden. So here I am. Mrs. Tugby, said Trotty, who had been going round and round her in an ecstasy. I should say chicken stalker. Bless your heart and soul. A happy new year, and many of them. Mrs. Tugby, said Trotty, when he had saluted her. I should say chicken stalker. This is William Fern and Lillian. The worthy dame, to his surprise, turned very pale and very red. Not Lillian Fern, whose mother died in Dorsetshire, said she. Her uncle answered, yes, and meeting hastily, they exchanged some hurried words together, of which the upshot was that Mrs. Chickenstalker shook him by both hands, saluted Trotty on his cheek again of her own free will, and took the child to her capacious breast. Will Fern, said Trotty, pulling on his right-hand muffler. Not the friend that you was hoping to find? I, returned Will, putting a hand on each of Trotty's shoulders, and like to prove a most as good a friend, if that can be, as one I found. Oh, said Trotty, please to play up there. Will you have the goodness? Had Trotty dreamed? Or are his joys and sorrows and the actors in them? But a dream himself, a dream the teller of this tale, a dreamer, waking but now. If it be so, O oh listener, dear to him in all his visions, Try to bear in mind the stern realities from which these shadows come, 
and in your sphere. None is too wide and none too limited for such an end. Endeavor to correct, improve, and soften them. So may the new year be a happy one to you, happy to many more whose happiness depends on you. So may each year be happier than the last, and not the meanest of our brethren or sisterhood debarred their rightful share in what our great Creator formed them to enjoy. The End This concludes this reading of The Chimes by Charles Dickens. If you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe. To request our next book or shop our store, visit aireadtome.com. Thanks for listening.